Welcome everybody to Brown University and to the Fall Language Pedagogy Workshop presented to you by the Center for Language Studies at Brown University and the Consortium for Language Teaching and Learning. My name is Jane Sokolowski and I've been the director at Brown Center for Language Studies for the past three years. I'm also a faculty member in German Studies where I've taught German for over 20 years. It's especially exciting to be here this afternoon in the fall of 2021. We all have learned to adjust to a new way of doing things and the virtual conference that we have this year is quite different from the one that was originally planned for fall 2020. And it's different than the consortium symposium on genre-based pedagogy that we last had at Brown in 2016. On the positive side, we are able to reach and include many more people through this virtual venue. We are happy to have so many people outside of New England and the Northeast be able to Zoom with us this afternoon. The registration numbers this year are quite high. It certainly exceeds what we most likely would have had in person. Still, that personal connection of chatting before and after a talk or when walking between venues is sadly missed. We keep talking about and reading about what changes that happened during the pandemic will stay with us. I think the takeaway here is to organize conferences with a hybrid format, with presenters being in person and the audience having the choice of virtual or in person. This allows for greater outreach to many interested people, but the intimacy of the in-person. To try to enjoy some of the community building aspect of an in-person conference, we've scheduled an opportunity after the keynote for discussion and invite you to join one of the 15 breakout rooms that we have created according to languages and meet up with old friends or connect with new ones. And yes, we did turn on the private chat feature so you can chat between just people you wanna chat with. Before I continue, I wanna thank my colleague, Lule Su from the Department of East Asian Studies at Brown, who had the idea for this workshop and spent many hours working with his co-organizers, Claire Menard from Cornell and Fan Lui from Yale to send the call for proposals, set the schedule and create the website. Behind the scenes, we have our very capable staff members from Brown's Media Services and our super organized, friendly and helpful Danielle from Brown's Event Services. Thank you all very much for the making the workshop run smoothly and for your extreme patience with all of our questions and concerns. Thank you all very, very much. And since we are not actually in Providence at Brown, and many of you are from universities outside of the consortium, I wanted to say a little bit about Brown University and language learning. Like many consortium schools who have a Center for Language Studies or a Language Resource Center, we are lucky to have our Center for Language Studies that was founded in 1987 to be a hub for language learning at Brown and to provide community for language faculty who teach in what we sometimes refer to as the language sequence and who often mentor graduate student teaching assistants. These language faculty were and continue to be lecture track faculty. Through the initiative of members of the CLS, lecturers received voting rights in the faculty senate, ability to serve on campus-wide committees, job security with three and six year contracts being the norm, and the chance at promotion, most recently to a third tier we call distinguished senior lecturer. If you are a, at a university that has other conditions, I suggest you look at Brown as a role model in this regard. From the inception of the Center for Language Studies, when we used to have a language lab with computers, tech staff to help our students and ourselves, and a library of DVDs to borrow, the center grew to house faculty who taught what we sometimes referred to as less commonly taught languages, Hindi, ESL for graduate students, Arabic, Persian, American Sign Language, and Turkish. Last year, that group spun off to become World Languages and Cultures and forged its own identity. The center now works to support the teaching and learning of all languages on campus and offers programming to all faculty who teach languages. We try to work together with tenure track faculty and graduate students to bridge the divide that is often found at large R1 research institutions. The CLS also works with other units on campus to determine other languages that may be needed to complement faculty and student interest and so that our students have access to languages from around the globe. We have literally expanded the footprint of languages at Brown, which can be visualized in the screen. During the pandemic, the university renovated the brick building you see here um, so that the world languages and culture faculty now occupy the whole building. The CLS also occupies the sixth floor of the sciences library 
and has an associate director dedicated to graduate students, an assistant director of technology, who you will hear present tomorrow, an American Council of Learned Societies postdoc, administrative staff, and undergraduate student language ambassadors. Much of this growth and expansion has been motivated by conversations with people affiliated with the consortium who have been role models, offered suggestions, and taken time for conversations. I publicly thank the consortium for the, its support of this conference and for keeping the torch burning for languages. Today and tomorrow, it is great to be bringing faculty and graduate students together to talk about listening and listening comprehension. I know when someone knocks on the door, I hear that. When the fire engine speeds by <laughs> during my class, I hear that. But do I also listen to that or is it just a sound? What's the difference between listening and hearing? How do we help our students to know that when they hear the sound of a knock on the door, they need to listen as well and understand that someone wants to enter? When I hear the fire engine loudly speeding by, what am I listening to? How do I interpret that sound? It means a lot more than a disruption to my classroom, but it signals a person in distress, a grandmother saying a prayer and a host of other ideas. I hope the keynote and the presentations you'll listen to and participate in tomorrow give you pause to reflect on the choices we make in our classrooms to get our students to not just hear, but to also listen. Thank you very much for coming. And I'm going to now pass on my camera <laughs> to um, Stefan Shalikos, the executive director of the Consortium for Teaching and Learning to offer his opening remarks. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you, Jane. Um, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, event. I'm going to keep my comments short so we can get to the keynote speaker, but I do want to thank uh, Brown University, uh, Brown's University Center for Language Study, uh, Jane Sokolowski, as well as uh, Lulay Su, Claire Ménard, and Fan Liu for organizing uh, this workshop on meaning through sound rediscovering listening in the language classroom, which is part of the workshop series, which is hosted annually by the Consortium for Language Teaching and Learning. Um, as you may have heard me say in the past, uh, the central mission of the consortium is to support activities that enhance the quality of language teaching and learning on the campuses of each of the participating institutions while consolidating and building upon the strength of the individual programs at these institutions. Uh, the consortium does so by funding a series of workshop and symposia uh, that uh, advocate whenever possible for collaborative efforts between um, two or more partner institutions, uh, such as the workshop you will be, uh, you'll have the pleasure to attend this weekend. Um, let me remind people that the consortium will be sending its annual RFP for new workshop proposals in the coming month. Um, so look for it in your mailboxes. Uh, I, for one, look forward to reading your submissions, which I'm sure will be as exciting and as innovative as this workshop. Um, so without further ado, let me turn it over once again to Jane, who will introduce tonight's keynote speaker, who will talk to us about the role of that most Cinderella of the four skills in language education, um, listening. I hope that everyone has a great workshop. Back to you, Jane. Thanks, Stefan. So I would now like to welcome Professor Elvis Wagner to our conference. Back in May 2019, the court consortium board encouraged the organizers, Lulay Su, Claire Menard, and Fen Louis, to invite Professor Wagner to speak on the topic of listening in the language classroom. And we are very happy that he was able to join us this afternoon. Professor Wagner is not only an associate professor of TESOL at Temple University, but he is also the coordinator of the PhD in Applied Linguistics program and the coordinator of the World Languages Education Program. He has taught curriculum and methods courses at the undergraduate and graduate levels, and his research focuses on assessment and listening comprehension. Recently, he's been examining the difference between the comprehension of spontaneous natural language versus the scripted texts often found in our language classrooms. Professor Wagner is the co-author of the book, Assessing L2 Listening, Moving Towards Authenticity, published in 2018. 
And I just found out yesterday, he is the co-editor of the Routledge Handbook of Second Language Acquisition and Listening that is scheduled to be published in 2023. Without further ado, I will turn off my camera and invite Professor Wagner to begin his presentation. Thanks very much, Elvis. So thank you very much for, um, for inviting me to, to give this plenary address. I'm very honored to do so at the Consortium for Language Teaching and Learning. Um, you know, it's it's great that we have such a large crowd here. I'm I'm ambivalent about online conferences, but I do appreciate um, you know that allows many people to be able to attend. So thank you uh, for giving up your Friday afternoon. Um, as Jane said, I'm the coordinator of the World Languages K through 12 certification program at Temple, and I teach the World Language Methods course. I was a high school Spanish teacher for three years, and I've conducted research on learners of Spanish here in the U.S. But I am a professor of TESOL, so the majority of my research is on the teaching and the testing of, of ESL and EFL. So a lot of the research I'm gonna be talking about presenting here today is focused on English learning, but I'm very aware, obviously, that this is um, you know, for foreign language instructors, so I'm, I'm trying to make this talk relevant and applicable um, for that context. Okay, so listening. Um, in today's talk, I'm going to talk about listening and listening as the forgotten skill in teaching and research. But I think, I hope it is being rediscovered. Um, then I'm going to talk about the importance of using real world spoken language in the L2 classroom, focusing only, mostly on the unplanned, unscripted real world spoken language um, and the scripted planned spoken language found in many um, L2 classrooms. Then I'm going to talk about how listening has been taught. And also I'm gonna have a quick sidebar into how it's been tested, because I think it's important. And then I'm gonna finish with some takeaways, some, some really concrete, useful ideas, I hope useful for listening teachers. Okay. So second language listening. Um, the more you think about second language listening, the more you realize that it's hard, okay? I don't know if we appreciate just how difficult it is to do. When I'm teaching listening, um, you know, and I have students and we talk about the, the about, we, we, I always do this exercise where we talk about the things that are, we make a list of the things that make second language listening difficult. And the list gets really long and then we discuss it. And then the more we discuss it, we're all, we're always amazed that, that anyone can actually do it. There are just so many difficulties associated with it. Um, so talking about listening, sometimes it's referred to as the forgotten skill in language teaching and research. You've probably heard that. Um, I think there is something to that. It's hard to quantify, but there is something to this notion that it's the forgotten skill when, when it's compared to the other skills, at least. Okay. And then it, you have to wonder why that is the case. You know, it, it shouldn't be. It's the first language skill to develop in humans. Um, it's the primary means by which we acquire all the other skills, yet it seems to be forgotten in teaching and in research, um, at least in comparison to the other skills. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, but I have some guesses, some, some educated guesses. Uh, I think it's probably the forgotten skill of teaching because in some ways it's subsumed by speaking. Um, classroom listening was and often still is sort of thought of as, as part of speaking instruction rather than addressed as a separate skill. Um, and there's also you know, this notion that you speak a second language, you don't really listen a second language. I think there's also probably a belief, a mistaken belief that you can't really teach listening. You know, This idea that teachers can provide lots of practice, but it is probably perhaps less teachable than other skills like writing or speaking. And related to that last point, I think many language teachers were probably never explicitly taught how to teach listening. Um, and so then that sort of cycle continues. But I think one of the, perhaps the primary reason why listening is the, the forgotten skill in, in second language teaching is because of this traditional focus on, on grammar instruction. There is, you know, there has been, it still is a focus on, on grammar. And if, if you really believe that grammar teaching is, is what language learning is all about. You're going to do a lot of explicit grammar instruction, okay? But you're also going to throw in some writing because writing is good grammar practice. 
And you'll probably do some speaking because like writing, it requires syntactic processing. So it's also probably useful for grammar instruction. And then you might throw in some reading because with reading the, see, the reader, the student can see the target grammatical forms and the teacher can highlight those um, grammatical forms and, and um, do input flooding with them. But this doesn't really work with listening. Listening isn't, doesn't lend itself to grammatical teaching. Um, you know, it's, if, even if you present the grammatical form in spoken context, it's there and then it's gone, if it's too ethereal. So the listener isn't gonna notice it. Um, they're doing semantic processing anyway. So with reading, you can focus on it. You can do syntactic processing of those grammatical forms, but it doesn't really work with listening. So I think all of those things contributed to the, the, the lack of sort of prevalence of, of listening in the, in the second language classroom. And in second language acquisition research and SLA research, listening has definitely received less attention than the other skills, okay? And I've thought about this quite a bit recently about why it's the, the forgotten skill in, in SLA. And I think it comes back to those things I was talking about with teaching. But I think also interestingly enough, it kind of comes back to Krashen, okay? So Krashen's input hypothesis, hugely influential in L2 teaching and learning in the 1980s. A whole generation of language teachers, teachers were taught that L2 learners need comprehensible input, right? And that comprehensible input usually was spoken input in order to be successful language learners. So hugely influential in teaching, but I think there was a big pushback against um, Krashen and the input hypothesis in SLA, okay? For a lot of reasons, it, it, it lacked empirical evidence for its assertions. It neglected the role of output in language learning. It oversimplifies a very complex process, okay? So all of those critiques are valid, but I still think one of the reasons why um, SLA has not prioritized listening in, in SLA research is because of this sort of pushback against crashing, okay? Another reason, it's, it's difficult to research. It's much more difficult than the other skills. It's not directly observable. It's interrelated with the other skills. And so that probably contributes to it. And then finally, I think probably the most important thing, the crux of it is that it was due to the belief that people believed, obviously, listening is important. We know that for communication. But there was this belief that while it's important for communication, it might not be as important for actual um, language development and learning, okay? So there is and there was and probably still is this mistaken belief that listening for communication is important, but listening might not help very much with learning, okay? But, but starting in the 90s, listening started to get a lot more focus in SLA research and in the decades since, um, the research has really continued and there's a lot of um, research focusing on it now. Um, Jane mentioned that I am, I'm very excited to be co-editing a handbook on listening, the Rutledge Handbook of Second Language Acquisition and Listening. As far as I know, it's the first comprehensive collection focusing on the role of listening in SLA and it's to be published in 2023. Um, so there is a real increased intention, uh, attention to, to listening in SLA research, and I think that's good. And I think there's this recognition now that listening does lead to language learning, and that's why it's important for SLA research. Okay, so as I said, the importance of listening, really important in SLA and in teaching. Um, but I go back to this idea that listening is hard, right? Second language listening is really hard. And here's what I think is one of the fundamental problems facing our field, okay? As a whole, our field doesn't do a great job um, teaching learners to be able to actually use that language to communicate with other speakers of the language, okay? So I give this example a lot. When I tell someone that part of my job is to train world language teachers, um, they always look at me, I almost always get the same response. They'll look at me and they'll say, you know, I studied Spanish for three years in high school and two years in college. And then when I got to Madrid, I couldn't understand a word anybody said, okay? I get that all the time. You probably get that also when, you're, um, when you tell people that you're instructors of Chinese or French or Spanish or whatever, you get that same response. So let's think about that for a second. We teach our students in the classroom and we try to make them proficient users of the language. Um, they're spending hundreds or thousands of hours inside and outside of the classroom doing language tasks, 
studying vocab, doing grammar, all these things. And then they go off to a country where that language is actually spoken. And then they report, I studied Japanese for high, you know, three years in high school and two years in college. And when I got to Tokyo, I couldn't understand a word anybody said. So I think we need to think about how that happens. It shouldn't happen, but it does. And there are probably lots of reasons for it. And I don't want to spend too much time, you know, criticizing the profession and complaining about what we do wrong. But I want to focus on one specific thing, one concrete thing that I think we can do to improve the way we teach our learners. And I'm going to focus on this idea um, for how we can better address this issue in our teaching, in our materials, in our curriculum. And that's this idea of using real world spoken language to teach L2 listening. Okay, not a new idea, but it's really important. I think this idea of using authentic spoken input in the classroom, using spoken texts that include real world spoken language, using texts that are similar to and representative of the types of spoken language that our learners will experience on the streets of Rome or Berlin or Beijing or wherever. Okay. Um, that kind of real world spoken language often is different from the textbook text that they might get exposed to in the classroom. So what is a textbook text? Textbook texts are the recordings that are provided um, with the textbooks that we use for teaching listening. They used to come on cassette tapes um, and then CDs, DVDs. Now they might be um, links, URLs to um, you know, spoken text that we can use. And then they have exercises, tasks to go along with them. Usually pre-listening tasks, while listening tasks, post-listening tasks. Okay, so those are textbook texts. On those texts, what do the speakers sound like? Okay, in those textbook texts, speakers speak slowly, very slowly. They enunciate clearly, very clearly. They speak in full sentences. They never backtrack or hesitate or, or pause or make mistakes. They don't have connected speech. They don't use a lot of slang. In other words, they don't sound very much at all like the way people actually speak on the streets of Beijing or Seoul or wherever, where people speak quickly and they mumble and they mumble in incomplete sentences and they backtrack and they make mistakes. Um, they have lots of connected speech and they use a lot of slang. Okay, so very, very different types of characteristics of the spoken text, real world and textbook texts. So I think of it this way, I, I like this idea of thinking about how scripted a text is, okay? Or how planned a spoken text is. So when we're speaking, in most situations in real life, we're speaking almost entirely extemporaneously with almost no planning time, okay? In some cases, you know, you might have time to plan what you're gonna say, and then you can plan it all out word for word and revise and, and practice and polish. So I've come up with this idea of a continuum of scriptedness, okay? where the idea that a speaker will have varying amounts of time to plan or script what they're going to say. So think about this maybe like the life of a university student. Um, in some contexts, they might be having a conversation with a friend at a cafe and they're talking and, and speaking and listening and they're uttering pretty much simultaneously. They have virtually no planning time what they're thinking about they're gonna say, okay? And then there might be another context where they're assigned a formal oral presentation in class. And they might have a couple of weeks to prepare for it and they plan, and they, they write it and they edit it, they practice it, okay? So that's on the other end, that's on the scripted end of the continuum. And then there might be points in between where they have varying levels of, of planning time, um, scriptedness, okay? And the, the same goes for the listener. The listener is sometimes gonna hear texts that have you know, that are totally unscripted, they might hear some that have totally scripted and they might hear things in between, okay? I think it's important, so I think this idea of continuum of scriptedness is, is useful, but I think we really need to stress the idea that in the majority or maybe the vast majority of real world spoken context, the listener is going to hear texts that are on that unscripted end of the continuum, okay? In the classroom and in the textbook texts, it seems like almost all of the texts are on that scripted end of the continuum and there, there's a real disconnect there. Okay, so how are scripted and unscripted texts different? What makes them sound different? I've reviewed a lot of literature on this and I, I've sort of categorized three major categories. So um, they differ in their organizational characteristics, their lexico-grammatical characteristics and their phonological characteristics. 
So I'm going to talk about each one of these for a couple of minutes because I think they're important. Organizational characteristics. Okay. Unplanned spoken discourse tends to be less logically organized than planned text, okay? Because of the, because of the way the real-time nature of conversational interaction, okay? A writer has time to plan, organize, revise it, all this stuff. And in one, they're doing that. They're, they're working to present the information as clearly as possible, logically organized in a linear manner without um, backtracking and, and false starts and hesitations and things like that, hesitation phenomena. Okay. In contrast, unscripted texts, that speaker doesn't have the luxury of time. They're composing and uttering at almost exactly the same time. Okay. So what that means is that spoken texts are, are less logically organized. People backtrack and they go backwards. Um, they're not always linear. Um, and then there's a lot of pausing and then and hesitations and false starts and repetitions where the speaker says, oh, I forgot to mention that, okay? Where the speaker is trying to think about what they're gonna say and how they're gonna say it. So a, a way to, to, to illustrate that, I think, is to think about when we see a written text on a piece of paper, we see this, right? Um, you know, it looks good, it's all nice and clean, okay? That's great. But you have to remember, that's the final draft, okay? That's not the initial draft. That's gone through a lot of revisions and things. In contrast, when you're a listener, you hear the first draft of a spoken text, okay? So that first draft of the spoken text looks a lot like that initial draft of a, a written text, okay? There's scratching out and there's hesitate, there's arrows going back here. So what we think of as the, the, the present, when the oral text comes out is, is the first draft. And I think that's really useful to think about it that way, okay? So, and I wanna talk about, I mentioned filled pauses. I wanna talk about filled pauses for a second because I think this is really important and really overlooked, okay? I, I, I find it really interesting. So filled pauses, you might not think about them a lot. Um, in English, we have things like um and uh, like, you know, I mean, we have lots of them. And L1 English speakers don't think about them. They're often unaware of how common they really are, how ubiquitous they are in the language, okay? Filled pauses are more common than unfilled pauses, especially for L1 speakers. They usually occur as a speaker is thinking about what they're trying to say and how they're gonna say it, okay? So again, incredibly common. They occur all the time. And as L1 listeners, we don't even think about them, okay? The deal is with texts, with these hesitation phenomena, these filled pauses are much more difficult for L2 listeners to comprehend. There's a lot of research that demonstrates it. And it's actually surprising how much, it's much more difficult than you would expect, okay? Because L2 learners often, they don't realize that these are filled pauses, okay? Then instead, they hear this and they think it's a word, they're trying to process them, they assign semantic meaning to them, and in the process, they lose a lot of comprehension, okay? So they're surprisingly difficult. And I, I will give you a really interesting example that demonstrates this. Okay, so Carney, 2018, um, wrote his dissertation about, and he used um, interesting texts about with Japanese learners in English, okay? So they were intermediate and advanced, you know, fairly advanced learners. And he had them do an oral repetition task, okay? So they had to listen to an oral text and then they had to repeat orally what they'd heard, okay? So there were 20 of them and they heard, I um, had a lot of trouble, okay? And then they were supposed to repeat that back. And what's fascinating that there were 20 of them, no one decoded that filled pause um as um as a filled pause, okay? Instead, all 20 of them, every single one of them, intermediate and advanced learners, trying to assign semantic meaning to it, okay? And this is what they usually reported hearing. I am had a lot of trouble, okay? They didn't realize the um was a filled pause. They tried to give it a meaning and they gave it am. And what's, what's interesting is that some of them even literally said, this doesn't make any sense because I am had is ungrammatical, but that's what I heard, okay? So it's, it's just, to me, to me, it's amazing how important those filled pauses are and yet how we don't do nearly enough to, to demonstrate them and teach them to our learners. Okay, so getting back to the, the, the categories, the three major categories, the lexicogrammatical characteristics. Um, 
they will vary according to whether the texts are planned and written. Okay, so um, unplanned spoken discourse tends to have less complex syntax, shorter idea units, fewer embedded clauses, less formal academic vocabulary than written language. Okay, and what's interesting about this is that these things would seem to make to make unscripted text actually more comprehensible. Okay, these are things that are actually going to help the L2 listener than when they're listening to more formal sort of written um, language. Okay. The slang and colloquial language probably um, makes comprehension more difficult, but, but this second category actually helps um, L2 listeners. Okay, the third category is the phonological characteristics. Okay, they tend to differ a lot from scripted spoken language, especially formally spoken, um, mostly because of connected speech. Okay, unplanned spoken language, rapid spoken language has a lot of connected speech. So, Things like reduction and contraction and linking and assimilation and deletion and appenthesis. Okay. Um, you know, if you're speaking rapidly, your articulatory organs are moving very quickly and they don't quite get exactly where they want to go before they change um, and move to a different direction. And so, with connected speech, the, the, the texts kind of um, connect and go together. Okay. And if you think about this, this is one of the most difficult aspects of L2 listening. Okay, the listener has to segment the incoming speech into meaningful units. And segmenting is hard. It's really hard. For novice L2 listeners, the input stream can sound like an unbro unbroken stream of, of, of spoken of the sounds, and, but not words, okay? The listener has to segment them, and that's very hard to do. It's even harder to do when there's a lot of connected speech, okay? And that's, and connected speech is ubiquitous. We do this all the time. And I wanna stress, I can't stress enough, connected speech is not bad, right? It's not sloppy, it's, it's just natural. It's a fact of life, it's the way we speak. Um, that's the way we speak, and that's what the L2 listener has to be able to understand, okay? It's really hard to do, but it's, it's, it's a fact of life, okay? And this, again, this is one of the fundamental differences between reading and listening, okay? L2 readers don't have difficulty segmenting the written input. It's already segmented for them by the writer. The writer provides this white space between the words, okay? In contrast, L2 listeners have difficulty segmenting the oral input because there isn't that white space between the words. It would be nice, but it, but it doesn't occur. And this is a really big difference between a lot of scripted an unscripted language where the speaker is speaking rapidly and composing and uttering at the same time. When they're doing that, they have very little ability to, to really focus on enunciation. They can't, they don't have the cognitive bandwidth to think about how am I going to enunciate this clearly? Okay. Instead, they're doing all these other things. Um, and so it's difficult to do to speak um, to enunciate. Okay. Um, in a and what's, what's interesting is that speech rate and connected speech are definitely correlated. The, in general, the, the faster you speak, the more connected speech there's going to be. And at the same time, it, the faster you speech, speak results in lower comprehension. The more connected speech there is results in lower comprehension. So it's, it's kind of a double whammy. So this is what L2 listeners find especially difficult. Being able to understand rapid speech with lots of connected speech and of course, that's exactly the type of language they're often not exposed to in language classrooms and in textbook texts, okay? So I've been talking for a while about the differences between unscripted real world spoken language um, where speakers uh, speak quickly um, with nonlinear organization and slang and filled pauses and all these other things that you know, seems to make comprehension more difficult for the L2 listener. And then we contrast that with the, what the L2 listener experiences in a lot of classrooms and on high stakes exams, <clears throat> where they're often exposed to texts that are spoken texts that are written, revised, edited, polished, and then read aloud. Often they're read aloud by professional voice actors who are trained to speak and enunciate clearly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, I think we're starting to see a change. Um, this isn't anything new, but there is Research on textbooks that, that seems to suggest that textbook publishers are starting to be more aware of this and starting to acknowledge it and starting to introduce some of it into their materials. Um, I think textbook publishers are doing more on this than they were 15 years ago, but progress is slow, very slow. 
Um, teachers, I think teachers are very aware of this. They seem to be aware of the need to use real world spoken language and they, they want to prioritize it in their classroom. They seem to be aware of it. Um, there also is this idea though that they're not exa exactly sure how to do it in their classrooms, okay? Um, I talk to you know, students in my methods classes, I talk to other teachers and instructors. They're almost always on board with this idea of, of using real world spoken language, but they often talk about how they're not sure exactly how to do that. <clears throat> so the question then becomes, why don't textbook writers, materials developers do more with unscripted real life spoken language? Honestly, I find it really surprising that textbook publishers don't do more, that they don't include more language, authentic language in their materials. To me, this should be the default. Um, it's not like this is a new issue. People have been calling for the use of more authentic materials for decades. So why don't they? Um, I don't know. I really don't. Um, Gilmore talked about how textbook publishers are reluctant to follow the pendulum swings in the profession. They talk about textbook publishers are conservative. They don't want to take risks by, by that they do the same thing all the time, the, the tried and true. Um, they're also very reluctant to abandon a structural syllabus that seems more concrete, objective. Um, and then also Gilmore also talks about how there's a, you know, there's still a big gap between um, researchers and practitioners. I take it a, a couple of steps further in a, I talk about how textbook re publishers are reluctant because real, real world texts might sound unprofessional, okay? And I think that's a real thing. They don't want their, their texts to sound like they just cobbled them together, okay? It's a bad reason, a really bad reason, but I think that is a part of the reason why they don't do it. Um, another possible reason is that they're not used on high stakes listening tests. And I'm gonna talk about that for, uh, for quite a bit in just a little bit. And then finally, another reason is I think they're often too concerned that these real world spoken texts are too difficult for a lot of learners, okay? Um, this last point I think is really interesting. Um, I think as language teachers, obviously we wanna help our students so we present the input so that it's as comprehensible as possible. We make that comprehensible input. Um, we don't want them to be intimidated or become demotivated by language that's too difficult or it can be anxiety inducing. And you know, that's important, uh, that totally makes sense. But I also think it's a slippery slope. You know, teachers think my learners aren't ready for this yet. Um, it's too hard, we'll wait until next semester. And then next semester it's like, yeah, maybe we're gonna wait till next semester and then next semester never comes. So I think we need to really be vigilant and really try to introduce this early on, introduce this idea of real world spoken language very early on, even as beginners, okay? And near the end of the talk, I'll go into more detail about how we can do that. All right, so I was also mentioned earlier, one of the reasons why textbook publishers might not integrate these types of materials into their textbooks <clears throat> is because high stakes tests don't seem to do it, okay? Um, I, my, my main area of research is language assessment. Um, I think we probably all agree that testing, especially high stakes testing, can have a real impact and washback effect on teaching and learners, okay? So I read a lot of, second language assessment research. I go to a lot of language conferences and there's a lot of talk about this idea of impact and washback. Um, it's increasingly important focus of testing research. But what's interesting is that the assumption is that it, it has a huge impact, but there's actually not so much research evidence showing that it actually does. So that there is a real disconnect between how LT listening is tested and high stakes English tests and how it's taught in many classrooms, okay? So um, I wrote, I co-wrote a book with Gary Oki, Assessing L2 Listening Ability, Moving Towards Authenticity. And in this book, we identified four major themes in the research on the assessment of L2 listening ability, okay? So one was the use of authentic real world spoken texts that I'm talking about today, um, the effects of different speech varieties and accents, the use of audio visual texts, and assessing listening as part of an interactive speaking listening construct. So all four of these relate to authenticity, the extent to which the test tasks are similar to and representative of real world spoken tasks, 
Okay. We argue that test developers should work to make their listening test tasks more authentic, more similar to real life um, listening tasks. Because if you do that, it has a two, two-fold effect. One, it's going to make your test more valid, which is the whole idea, the whole point. Okay. But the other thing is that if you make them more authentic, more similar to, more representative of real world listening tasks, that's going to have a positive effect on teaching and on learning. Okay. Um, so that's our argument. Okay. But then when I go and I look um, at the high stakes listening tests, um, I see a real disconnect. So I'm going to give you some examples to these four themes from a lot of from high stakes English uh, listening tests, because that's what I know best. But I'm also going to report on listening tests that are relevant, probably for many of you, including the Praxis language exams, the Actful exams, and the, uh, the HSK. Okay, those are the ones I know some about. So in the use of authentic real world spoken texts, in a couple of studies I looked at a number of high stakes English listening tests. Um, TOEFL IBT, the IELTS, those are the two you know, dominant ones, but also a number of other ones in the North American context. And also the CET, the Aiken, and the GBT are, are um, English proficiency tests in Asia. And what I found is that very, very few, you know, of the dozens of different types of listening test tasks on these tests, only a couple of them used what seemed to be real world spoken languages, language. The, the high stakes tests don't prioritize them in English. And the same seems to go for the high stakes um, listening tests in the other languages, okay? Um, they, they don't prioritize it. They often don't do even have them at all. I will say that one of the, in reading the report for the uh, Praxis, Praxis exams, for the Spanish exam, and this might have applied to the other uh, languages as well, they claim that all section list selections in section one are based on authentic recordings of native speakers. Therefore, the transcriptions reflect real spoken language and may contain hesitation, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's interesting. At least there's starting to be some acknowledgement of it and use of it, which is, which is wonderful, but still just a, a, a tiny little portion of it. Okay, that the second um, major theme, the effects of different speech varieties and accents. Okay, so frankly, high stakes English listening exam, exams are terrible at this. They really are. They seem to use spoken text that use exclusively the standard dialect, and they were usually American and British, they don't use regional varieties. They don't use um, sudden, like Southern American English or they don't use um, African American English. Um, they never use L2 accented English, okay? Never, it's always just the standard variety. To my knowledge, actual praxis HSK seem to utilize also only the standard variety and accent. And that doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't because L2 listeners need to be able to understand all sorts of varieties, all sorts of accents, L2 accented um, language, not just the standard or dominant variety, even though that's what the tests um, always assess. All right, the use of audio visual texts on high stakes listening tests. I've always been very interested in the use of audio visual input in the teaching and testing of second language ability, uh, listening ability. Based on my own teaching experience, my own learning experience, um, I wrote my dissertation on this. Teachers use video all the time in their classroom, as they should. Learners use it a lot in their learning. There's this thing called YouTube and TikTok and all these other things. I mean, it's just such a part of, of language learning and life. Yet vid video is rarely used on assessments of second language listening ability, okay? I've done a number of studies on this. Um, I've written what I think are very persuasive arguments about why you should use audiovisual input. From a theoretical standpoint, there's no way you can argue against it, okay? For the vast majority of domains, real life contexts, the listener can see the speaker and can use the visual information provided by the speaker, the physical background context, body language, gestures, facial expressions, all those things. It's a no-brainer. It's an absolute no-brainer. Okay, so Kong et al. 2019 reviewed 20 high stakes academic L2 English listening tests. Guess how many of them use video on their tests? Zero. None of them. None. Actful Praxis HSK don't seem to use visual audio visual text either. Okay. 
blows me away. It's just, just absolutely amazing. From a theoretical standpoint, you cannot justify using audio only text, and yet that's what they do. Okay, teachers use it in the classroom, learners use it, but high stakes listening tests are audio only. Okay, so why? Why don't they use video? Um, money, 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 three reasons, but I'm going to save that for a different discussion. All right, the last one, the last um, category, assessing listening as a part of interactive speaking listening construct. Okay, this topic is related to the idea that listening can be interpretive, but can also be a part of interactive speaking listening ability, interpersonal mode. Okay, a lot of second language listening assessments focus on interpretive listening. Okay, for a number of reasons, not really good reasons. First off, it's much easier to assess interpretive listening than to assess listening as part of an interactive speaking and listening construct. Um, it's much more practical, reliable, cheap to do it that way. Assessing interactive speaking and listening presents a lot of challenges, especially because it's hard to do it reliably. And reliability is something that um, test developers really prioritize and are concerned about. And in practice, there really seems to be two camps, okay? So in the first camp, things like IELTS and the ACTFL, they sort of, they sort of take the idea, you know what? Interactive speaking and listening is really important. It's a vital component of communicative language ability. So we need to test it, even though it's impossible to standardize the administration, even though we're not gonna be able to do it reliably, we're gonna introduce measurement error. It's gonna be hard to score. It's gonna be expensive. But you know what? That's what we're going to do. It's worth it. That's um, what we we have to prioritize. Okay. And then there's another camp, sort of the TOEFL and the Praxis. And of course, TOEFL and Praxis are both by ETS, so they have similar sort of ideas. And the HSK also seems to be that well, you know, interactive speaking and listening. Yeah, that's important, but um, we can't do it. We can't do it reliably or fairly. Um, and it's really expensive and inefficient. So instead, we're just going to assess presentational speaking and we're going to assess interpretive listening. And those seem to be pretty good proxies um, for the interpersonal mode, okay, for inter interactive speaking and listening. So two, two very different takes on, on the importance of assessing um, interactive speaking and listening ability. So again, it is fascinating to me as a language tester to look at how test developers, researchers, talk about the importance of impact by design, the importance of creating tests and test tasks that are gonna have a positive impact on test users, where test developers make the S idea of positive impact a primary component of their validity argument. And yet the examples that I described most high stakes listening tests do not use authentic real world spoken text, okay? They do not use different speech varieties and regional accents or L2 accent um, language. They don't use audiovisual texts. And a lot of them don't use, don't try to assess listening ability as part of interactive speaking and listening, the interpersonal mode. It's really discouraging, it really is. I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, teachers in the classroom are doing these things. Um, yet the high stakes language listening tests are not, okay? Testers talk about the importance of having a positive impact on teaching and learning, but in these examples, it's the teachers that are way ahead of the testers. Okay, so I'm going to get off my testing soapbox now, um, but I, before I conclude, I wanna provide some practical, useful advice for all the things I've talked about today and for the, the teaching of second language listening. Um, I'm going to start with some no, some no brainers, but I think they're still really important. Okay, and worth talking about. So, no brainer number one: we need to provide lots and lots of meaningful listening practice. Okay, L2 learners need thousands of hours of input and interaction with the language. Okay, we don't have we don't have nearly enough class time with L2 learners to provide those thousands of hours of input. So. We need to make our listening instruction in the classroom as efficient as possible. We need to teach learners how to listen, how to monitor their own listening. Um, and perhaps just as importantly, we need to create opportunities for out-of-class listening. We need to create 
listening tasks that they can do and use and, and learn from outside of the classroom. Okay, another no brainer, but I feel strongly about it. Use audio visual input when teaching listening. For the vast majority of real world language use context, the listener can hear and see the speaker. They can utilize the nonverbal information provided by the speaker. So we should be providing listening tasks, teaching tasks in which the listener is able to use the oral and the visual information and promote that, their ability to do that. Another no brainer, um, use spoken input with lots of different varieties of the language, not just the standard variety, but use regional accents and L2 accented um, language. It's just, it's a no brainer. And what I think is really interesting about it is there's no downside to doing this. There really isn't. Providing different varieties and accents and the spoken input is going to make them better listeners. Um, and they're going to have to understand many different varieties, not just the standard variety. The, the research is very clear that the more familiar you get with a particular accent, the better able you are to comprehend it. So you need to provide lots of different varieties and accents of the language in listening um, activities. Okay, And very much related to that and really important, we need to teach our learners that there is no single correct or standard version of the language. That one variety isn't better than another variety. They're different, but not, but not better or worse. Okay. And finally, I think we need to teach interpretive listening. I think we do pretty well with that, but we also really need to, to teach listening as part of interpersonal communication, interactive speaking and listening ability. Actful came up with those three modes, so let's use them. Two more takeaways and a little bit more on these. Um, use authentic real world spoken text in the classroom. Let's get to the point where learners say, I studied Spanish for three years in high school and two years in college. And then when I got to Bogota, I could actually understand a lot of what the people were saying. So identify, find, create real world spoken texts, ones with rapid connected speech um, and hesitations and false starts and repetitions and back channels and all those other really cool characteristics of real world spoken, unplanned spoken language. Use those texts and create tasks to make listeners aware of these characteristics of unplanned spoken language. Create tasks that draws their attention to these things so that they can hear them and identify them and then be able to understand them the next time that they're exposed to them in spoken input. Really important. Um, you can have listeners read along to a transcript where they can not only hear those components of real world speech, but they can hear and then see what they look like, what they sound like, where they occur, uh, what their function is, why the speaker uses them, lots of things you can do with them. I feel very strongly about this. Teach filled pauses, okay? Devote a lesson or two to filled pauses in your language. As language instructors, it's often difficult for us to see our learners making progress. It's a, it's a long-term process, right? Of learning, learning a language, but teaching filled pauses can be one of those, it's literally one or two lessons that will stay with those learners forever. It's a real concrete activity that can have a real impact on learners. I have a, I kind of like this lesson. I have a lesson plan and activities that was published in T-Skull Connection. It's about teaching filled pauses in English and it has some texts and some um, works resources you can use. So you might want to look at that for ideas. And then I think a really important thing also is to find resources for authentic spoken text and use them. Okay, so about two years ago, I gave a talk similar to this at the East Asian Languages Department at Columbia. Um, I'm sure some of you were, were at that talk. And I spoke with a Spanish professor there, Guadalupe Ruiz Fajardo, and she told me about this project and then I, I checked it out and it's just fascinating. She has this, this database, Corpus de Conversaciones, um, it's an open and free uh, collection of uh, audiovisual texts of real world spoken language. And it has transcripts and it has lists of interactional features and it has, um, you can organize it, you can search through it by student level and, and topics and number of participants. And it's just an amazing resource. So if you're an instructor of Spanish, check it out. If you're an instructor of other languages, 
look for similar resources to this or even create your own like this because it's such a hugely helpful resource. All right, and my last takeaway is use real world spoken text, but change the task demands, okay, according to the ability level of the listeners. So I think this is something that we can make our lives easier, actually. You can use the same text with advanced listeners as you do with beginning listeners, but you change the task demands, okay? So you use longer texts with advanced learners, maybe shorter sections of the text um, with less advanced learners. You slow the text down by pausing or even physically manipulating it, you know, at 75% speed, things like that, just to slow it down. Um, you do play the text multiple times. Don't be afraid, afraid to play it more than once or twice. Um, have them do a different while listening task each time. If you've gone through all the trouble of finding this text and creating a, um, a lesson about it, um, using it, then don't be afraid to use it. Make your, make your life easier. But, but each time you play the text, have them only do one thing. Don't have them listen for this and for listen to a second thing because they can't do that. That's very hard. Finally, use captions or partial captions or parts of the transcripts to help lower level listeners follow along with that more difficult text. All of those things can serve to make real world spoken text that might be considered too difficult for, for lower ability learners. They can actually become accessible then and, and comprehensible. So modify the task demands, not the text. All right, so very quickly to consider to conclude, uh, listening, I think, has been rediscovered. It was the forgotten skill in language teaching and certainly in SLA research for a long time for a number of not very good reasons, but I don't think it is anymore. Um, there is an increased recognition in the field that listening is incredibly important, okay? Not only because it's a vital component of interaction and communicative competence, but also because it's recognized as a fundamental component of the language learning process, okay? So thank you. Thank you very much, Elvis. If I could find my clapping hand or whatever, I would be sending up that emoji as I'm, I'm doing this for everyone who you can't see, but thank you very much. Um, we, do, we do have the Q&A feature that people can um, type in a question. Uh, I do have one or two that, that are already available. So if you've had a break and had a little sip of water, I'll read out the one that came through from um, Chris Kaiser. First of all, he thanks you. And then he's wondering if you have colleagues who are very much wedded to audio only materials in both the classroom practice and for their assessments, what are some effective arguments for persuading these colleagues to move to more audiovisual materials? specifically speaking to the belief that students need practice with audio only texts? Um, I just, you know what? I want to quantify um, sometime. I, I, I have this plan to, to just go 24 hours and keep track of all of the listening events that I do in a day and see what percentage of the time I can see the speaker and what percentage of the time I can only hear the speaker. I haven't quantified that, but I would say probably 80, 90% of the time, you know, um, you speak on the phone, you listen to the radio, but the vast, sometimes you're in the dark, but the vast majority of the time you can see the speaker, right? So why are listening in a second language is hard enough. So why are we making it more difficult by taking away this visual information that they do um, in real life context. It's it just, it's illogical. Um, there's this idea that listening is oral only, um, but you know, listening involves lots of processing of different types of information. So I just, I just, what the argument I think you can make is that L2 listening is hard. Um, you want them to use whatever resources they can. Um, if you're on the streets in Mexico City, you're not, when you're having a conversation with someone, you're not gonna close your eyes and not listen to, you know, and not be able to see what the speaker is. It just, it's not real world context. We can almost always see the speaker. So I think that's a compelling argument. It convinced me. <laughs> you, you just convinced me. Yes, Maybe, exactly. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, podcasts are so ubiquitous, ubiquitous nowadays. I wonder, you know, pe people are thinking of that and we should maybe for the advanced learners use more podcasts, but starting off, I totally agree with you with the audio visuals. And I also totally agree with you, Elvis, that on, on Monday, I'm gonna teach filled pauses. 
oh, in my great, German class, great. in my beginning German class, definitely. The problem, um, the problem with teaching filled pauses is that when you start teaching them, you become hyper aware of all the filled pauses in your in your language, your speech, and then the learners speech. will start pointing it out every time right. and laughing at you. But that's that's it's it's that's a useful um, exercise right there. True, that's true. Um, let me go back to the Q and A. Um, so Claire is asking, what would you say to publishers, instructors, or people who say that teaching non-standard language is too specific and would not appeal to a wide audience of language learners? So when you talked about dialects and accents. Um, you know, it's publishers. It, I think publishers are very, very cognizant of their product looking and sounding good. You know, they want it to sound professional. I do think this idea of sounding unprofessional with pauses and digressions and things, and then with non-standard varieties of the spoken text, that's people are gonna be reluctant and learners will be reluctant. You know, I think learners probably think, oh, I only want the standard variety because that's the good English or good Spanish or whatever, but of course, you know, there is no standard variety and um, one language, one dialect, one variety isn't better than others. So it's a tough sell. It definitely is. I think, you know, there are textbooks out there though that, that make that argument that the, their whole selling point is that they're real world spoken texts with different varieties and things. So they make that argument. I don't know how well they sell. It's, 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 a, it's a tough argument to, to, to really get publishers to, to, to pick up on it. Yeah, I feel then the, you know, the onus is on the instructors to to find those materials like related. Maybe you have a study abroad program in a certain area in the country where of the language that you're teaching. So then you would, you know, provide examples to help your students when they do go abroad. Um, I see a question from Simon also begins with filled pauses. So let me read it for you. <laughs> so filled pauses along with other discursive features or strategies that you mentioned, point towards discourse analysis. Would you say that focus on discourse analysis has a place in the teaching of listening comprehension? And if so, could you speak to how it may be implemented? Um, yes, I do think it, it can be important and it can be a useful way to do it. I, I'm not gonna even try and bluff my way out of this one. I, it, it would be very hard for me to, to come up with like how you can do that right now in this context. But, but I know that my wife is a discourse analyst. So we have a lot of, of discourse conversations. And one of the things she, she points out in, when you read the, the discourse analysis uh, work is that like the way phone calls are presented in textbooks, you know, it's nothing like the way phone, call, phone conversations actually happen, okay? Um, so the other things, these sort of ideas about how a particular genre of text plays out and it, it really doesn't play out that way. So I think we having authentic materials where you do more of a discourse anal analysis of, of the way it, it's going and have them listen for it and maybe follow transcripts and then ask them, why did the person say this here? Why did they change the conversation or why did they do that? I think it can be really useful for, for learners. Um, and it, it helps them see like the bigger discursal picture, which, which sometimes when they're focusing on just the, the phonemes and the, the sounds and the words that they're missing out. Um, I had I had a question, um, Elvis. When you mentioned these other tests, um, for our our students who come to the university, a lot of them have taken AP language classes, and I think the more we as instructors know about those tests, like what does what do our students do in order to get a five or a four on the AP test? I was wondering if you happen to know about the AP test, the listening component of that, and if you have an any insight on that? How, I, if we knew what the, our students have done in order to place into an advanced course at Brown, um, that might be helpful for us. I actually don't know. I, I have looked at it in the past, but I can't remember. I've looked at a lot of tests. 
Um, yeah. But I don't remember offhand. And that's something I need to look at because I, I can't say, my guess is that they probably don't because it's very formal. It's very sort of structured. Um, and they're they're very conservative. They don't don't change a whole lot. So I doubt that they have you know addressed this this issue. But it, but I don't really know. Yeah, that would be something to look into. Yeah. I remember we yeah. did a sort of a practice AP here at Brown, and it was back in the day when we had to like a student had a, a recording device and then had to press it and listen and only had however many seconds that yeah. was. Yeah. Um, and speaking of like recording devices and technology, do you, so one of my favorite tools that I learned um, through the pandemic was Edpuzzle, which easily is an app that easily integrates into YouTube. And it's a type of uh, feature where I can take two minutes of a video and then easily insert a question for my students, a question related to in interpretation or an extension question. And it's also really easy for me to give feedback on it, whether by written comments or by audio. Do you have any suggestions for any sort of technology that would that that faculty or people on the call here could implement to help with listening? Um, I don't offhand, but that sounds really good, right? Just it's to be really able to good, stop huh? it and insert it and have them, you know, one of the things I think that's really useful. It, it, when, when I teach people that are going to be listening teachers, that the one thing that I sort of take away is this idea of having listeners predict what they're going to hear next. So like they're listening to a text, they're constantly monitoring what they're hearing, and they're using incoming oral input to confirm that hypothesis or, or disconfirm it and then get a new sort of idea about what it's about. And one of the ways to really promote that is to stop it periodically and then have them predict what's going to come next. And then they can go back and, and say, oh, were my predictions correct? Yes or no, why not? So exactly what you're saying with Edpuzzle, that seems to really lend itself to that where you stop it. What do you think, what's, what is your interpretation of the text so far? What do you anticipate is gonna come next? And then 30 seconds later, you stop it and say, were your predictions correct? Did you, did you, um, did, did what you think was going to happen actually happen? That's a really useful thing to do, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that would be fun. That would be entertaining for students doing it with movies where there's yeah. like a twist in the plot or something yeah. crazy yeah. happens. Our students definitely. would definitely like that, right? Um, let's see. So um, let's see. Uh, Stefan, who gave uh, uh, welcoming remarks, also has posted, and I'm going to read what he says. First of all, he says, thank you for such a concise, clear, and systematic discussion of the overall role of listening in the language classroom. You have outlined many of the guiding principles we should all use to help listeners become better language learners. But can you also briefly discuss how we might engage our students in identifying, thinking, and critically assessing the strategies they use when they listen? So it's- Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, I knew a but was coming too. Um, <laughs> so I, when I teach a listening class to to future teachers, I teach I use the um, the 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 book by uh, Vandergrift and Go, the Metacognition and Listening. Um, I think it's two thousand and fourteen, and I believe um, Christine Go just published the second edition of that. And that, their whole argument is the idea of the importance of metacognition. So having the listeners be aware of the types of things they're doing and monitoring um, their listening and being aware of what they're doing and, and whether that's effective or not. So I think teaching this idea of metacognition, teaching the, the listeners to be able to think about what they're doing and whether this strategy is working or if it's not working, or if it's inefficient, or if there's different ways that you can do it. Um, because I, 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 I've struggled with this a lot, like strategy instruction for listeners. Mm -hmm. I never really know what that means. You know, it, to me, it's like, what, what is a strategy? Or um, in some points, things I think, you know, maybe strategies are just conscious things that you do that eventually they become unconscious and then they're sort of skills. But metacognition is a little more straightforward where they're constantly thinking about what they're doing when they're listening 
and evaluating how well they are doing that listening um, and what they're not doing well and so how they might improve, do things differently. Um, so I, I'm not, I just, I, I've never been, I don't know how to say this, a fan or a proponent of sort of explicit strategy instruction because I just, I've never figured out how that works. Um, but but taking a, a, a broader or metacognitive um, strategy instruction, um, I think is more useful and more, more finite, more concrete. You, you can actually do it in, in a lot of listening events. Thank you. I'll be telling them not to multitask might help as well, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's see, I, let's see, Stefan, did you write something else? Did you write a comment? No, okay. All right, um, we apparently have some people who have a little experience with the AP Spanish language and culture exam. Um, I believe it is, and I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong, Lord Sabe from, is it Yale? Yes, so um, Lord has said, I've worked on the AP Spanish language and culture for many years. The listening parts are audio only. And um, someone who knows her, Margarita, mentions that there is an interesting exercise in the AP exam that has students complete conversations. Her colleague at Yale, Lord Sabe, prepared an excellent audio visual version of this type of exercise. So I guess there is, you know, on the one hand, there is just the audio, but um, Lords has decided audio visual would, would be a better exercise. Yeah, it, it was interesting um, when I was looking at the different praxis exams. I focused on the Spanish. I think they're the same across languages, but I'm not sure. But what, what was interesting about the the praxis exam was that they didn't assess interactive speaking and listening, but they sort of try. Or they sort of acted like they were because they had um, they had a listening component of a two person conversation, and then they stopped it. And then you had to, I think, write or speak what would be an appropriate response to that. So, you know, it, you weren't interacting with another human. But um, it was sort of a, a way to, to try and get at that interpersonal mode, which I'm not convinced worked. But mm -hmm. yeah, actually, now that you say that, I remember seeing that. And then sometimes the pauses was so long in the in the in the like the gap for that you had to answer that the student had to answer. It just became really awkward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Elvis. So I was thinking when I was listening to your 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 talk about oral exams that we give that we think maybe the classic end of the semester oral exam or midterm oral exam. Where do you stand on that as being an interactive uh, assessment of listening? As um, oral exams in general. I think, you know, I think it, it can be right. It's hard to do with high stakes standardized exams because by nature, by definition, they have to be standardized, right? So the input um, that the, the test taker gets has to be exactly the same for all test takers. But for classroom exams, even if they're high stakes end of, end of semester exams, you know, th there's more subjectivity involved and that's totally fine. That's allowed, that's, that's good. And so you have the ability to really probe and do different things with students of different ability levels. You know, um, you can do different things, scaffold it differently to, to, to really try and get what they can or cannot do. So that's, that's, that's one of the really nice things is that you're not constrained by that necessity to, to have it standardized. Reliability is, is less of a concern because you're the only person doing it. So I, I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Like you can, it's a lot easier to assess interactive speaking and listening ability um, when you're the teacher and the interlocutor and the test taker and the scorer and all these things because you're the same person as opposed to standardizing tests where you don't have that luxury. So I'm all for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not course, very we, efficient. We, it's a yeah, lot of we, your time and it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's painful at the end of the semester, but it's a good thing. And we want we want our students to succeed, right? We want yeah. them to do well in these in these final yeah. assessments. Um, I think one thing that's that's hard if you're working with graduate students is is teaching them to assess that oral exam. That would be something perhaps we can talk about in our discussion section later. And um, and you know, the, 
normally what we're doing there, we're, we're really focusing on the speaking, but the listening is a really important part of it. But how do you give them a listening score? That's, that's hard, you know, that that's, you can still, you can, you know, have that in your rubric. There's a lot more subjectivity involved, but I think it's, I think it's something you can do. And because you don't have to worry about the reliability nearly as much, so. Right. All right, I see that Nelika has written. First of all, she also thanks you very much for your talk uh, and suggests, I would highly recommend your book on assessing L2 listening, which appeared in our language learning and leaching, language learning and language teaching series through Benjamins. I don't have so much a question as a comment. Multimodal authentic texts are very much at the center of current post-communicative approaches, such as multiliteracies. Do you have suggestions for teaching worker teachers working in that multiliteracies framework? Um, no, I mean, I think so much of, of language now is multimodal and so many different things. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's amazing to me that we we're stuck in this sort of four skills thing. Okay, first off, I'm I'm from the the English, you know, the TOEFL, I mean the TESOL sort of component where we, we really do have the four skills, the reading and writing, listening, speaking. You know, actful at least has done so much, but to, to, to get these, you know, the modes of interpersonal and the, the interpretive rather than the four skills, and that's wonderful. But it's still, it's still, you know, life is multimodal now. So it, it just it, to me, it's just a no-brainer that you include so all different sort of modalities and technology and all these different components of language use in teaching and learning. Um, and I always think I was having, I was talking with my methods class on last on Wednesday, talking about back in my day when I was in high school learning Spanish about how there was no ability to get the input spoken input or even written input in Spanish outside of the classroom because it just didn't exist where I was going to high school and in the 1980s where there just wasn't the technology. And now there's the possibility of so much different types of input, multimodal input, um, so many different modalities, so many different ways of delivering that, that language. It's just, it's exciting. You know, you can do so many different things. Um, so less about how to do it and more of just keep it up, do it, do it as much as you possibly can. Thank you. So we do have uh, a, a question to, um, that Claire is asking. And she said that currently she's working on and presenting on, sub, on subtitling and subtitles. And what is your take on them? What do you think about them? Are they helpful or not? Should we be or should we not be? Um, you know, it's such a, there are so many different permutations there, right? Um, it can be in the target language, it can be in the, the L1, it can be um, written, it can be, um, I mean, there's just so many different things. They can be partial transcripts. So I think they can be incredibly useful, right? They can be incredibly useful for different contexts. Um, and the teachers can can help the learners to use them. So not just for comprehension, but for um, learning and acquisition, because I, I you know, subtitles are huge. Um, and and you're not, there's a lot of research on it. Surprise, surprise, if the subtitles in the um, in the in the L1, that's when they understand the most. If it's um, in the L2, if it's written, then it's gonna be less, of, but it, but it, it can be, they can be really useful for different tasks, different um, types of learning. And again, I think, again, the idea of promoting out of classroom language learning, because there just isn't enough classroom time to do it. So things with captions and things which make that language so much more accessible um, outside of the classroom, we can assign those and do things. And I think you really promote that out of classroom language um, learning and language use is really useful. Um, captions are good for that. Yeah, I'm reminded of Netflix and how many shows we can watch in various languages with yeah. the with the subtitles. Yeah, it's fascinating how that's changed just in the last couple of years and how our students have so much more access to that um, than those I've, of I've just growing up in the that, United States. Yeah, I just read that um, there are a number of people working on 
AI programs that will do simultaneous translation so that they, they can, um, so you don't have to spend out, uh, you know, a lot of money and, and months before you can dub um, a, a film or a TV show into a, a different language where the AI will do it in just like minutes and then it can be accessible, but then we're sort of losing the, uh, the L1 part of it. Yeah, and unfortunately, our students have found those types of uh, tricks yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's also very careful. I actually believe maybe someone in the audience knows that Zoom has a capability like that. I don't exactly, I haven't tested mm. it so much. But yeah, it's definitely becoming more and more prevalent, which is uh, very impactful for how we what, what exercises we ask our students to do. Um, so we have another question from Noah, who teaches Arabic. And let me just read it. Um, I agree with everything you said about the importance of interpersonal interpretive listening. Thank you so much. My question connects to the teaching of diglossic languages like Arabic, which um, is a language that I teach, where each country speaks a really different sort of Arabic, and all these are different to the unified written language that's found, sort of like Latin and Spanish, Portuguese and Catalan. There would be no way to expect that a student at the end of even four years would attain that sort of eclectic proficiency. Okay, I see where she's going. Okay, so do we just say that our goal is that at the end of four years, you will attain intermediate proficiency or do we make choices regarding which dialect to teach? So I don't know how familiar you are with Arabic or Arabic uh, instructors talking about this. Should we do a dialect? Should we do the written standard, modern standard Arabic or not? Oh, I, I know about it, but I don't know the right answer. I really yeah. don't. Um, because I, as far as I know, like the, the different regional varieties are so different that they, at some point they become mutually incomprehensible, right? Um, so, so I don't know. Um, it's, oh, I bet, I bet there are really interesting discussions in the Arabic department with, with, with things like that. You know, just because so, it, it, it's, it's even more, pronounced, I think, in Arabic than it is in languages like um, English and Spanish and French, which have a lot of geographical diversity and so a lot of regional variations. But but Arabic, it seems like it's, it's, it's even more pronounced. So I don't know. I really don't. Yeah, that, yeah. I've, I've, I would, um, I would have, like to be in on that discussion. I would like mm -hmm. to hear it. it would be yeah, fascinating. it's fascinating for those of you who aren't uh, teaching Arabic. It's uh, ask your Arabic uh, language colleagues what the discussion is about. Great, so are there any last minute questions? I don't see any more coming in through the chat. And I do see that we are close to 5.30. Um, so um, Elvis, thank you so much for delivering this virtually. I know it's very awkward to be teaching into your, or talking into your screen. Um, it's been really great this last 30 minutes with the conversation that we've had with you. And we definitely look forward to everyone who's gonna be presenting tomorrow. Um, to continue this discussion about listening and listening comprehension. And if there's, I don't know um, if we can, as a webinar, thank through emojis or not, but I am giving the round of applause for all of us here in the audience. And thank you very much, Elvis, for, for taking your time out and, and sharing your information with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to a lot of those discussions tomorrow. They look, they look great, so yeah. thank you. Yeah.